You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. The Lord's got a lot more going on sometimes than we really see because we have to take a look at what's going on behind the scenes. Because this is a supernatural book, and we don't pick up on that all the time. We want to make it some natural thing. And what God's saying is, wait a minute, here's the picture. Ezekiel's been showing it to you over and over again. Do you think this is going to be the same guy? The same one I've been talking about the last three times, Satan, Satan, Satan. It might be. It might be. Have you ever read a story in the Bible and questioned how it could even be true? Most stories we read out of the Bible sound like they could be a make-believe tale. That's because God is a supernatural being. He doesn't conform to what science tells us is true. In today's message, Pastor Ken is going to remind you that the stories from the Old Testament really happened. God really showed up in supernatural ways in order to protect His people and keep His promises. He will do the same for you. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, as he continues his message, Get Your Program. We're talking now the same area up in the north. This is where they put the place for demon demon worship. Well, they call them a god, but they're worshiping demons. The Bible says that. So this is the area. This is Dan looking at it from an aerial view. And if you go down, uh, you can actually see here you have a, a, brick, a gate, which is an entry into it. There's one from the uh, Bronze Age and one from the Iron Age. But the high place of Jeroboam is still in existence. This is where they worship golden calf. It was constructed right here in Dan. By the way, Dan is called that because the tribe of Dan settled there. They weren't supposed to settle there. They were supposed to settle south of Judah, but they had problems. They could not kick out the Philistines, so they, they went north. So they're here. And they become idol worshipers. They put the, the, this place in their, in, their, uh, in their land. I mean, you can actually kind of outline some of this as you look at it. If, there we go. They had the, the altar, you can see where that w- would have been, as well as a podium. And then they had chambers uh, all throughout it. Now, further north from here, and this is Mount Hermon and Bashan, and it's just, Mount Hermon today is in Israel, okay? It's right on the edge of the Syrian Israeli area. It's in Israel in Bash- and of course the Golan Heights which is called Bashan is in Israel now too. But if you go further north on the other side of the nation of Syria there's a place called Mount Zaphon. Mount Zaphon is another dark spiritual stronghold so that when you're talking to an Israelite and you say the, the north they're thinking of Hermon, Bashan, and they're thinking of Zaphon. 40 miles, or 40 kilometers rather, to the north of a town of Ugarit, which we've uh, uncovered, is the mountain Jebel al-Akra. And it's about 1,770 meters high. It's Mount Zaphon. Everybody accepts that pretty much at this point. Now, Mount Zaphon is right here. It's right next to the Mediterranean. And that was supposedly the home of Baal. And there were worshipers who would go up there and sacrifice to him and everything else. But in the Ugaritic tradition, uh, it, Baal's palace was on its peak. And it was always mentioned along with Baal at the same time. So again, for someone in Israel, when you talk about the dark north, you're talking about Hermon, you're talking about Zaphon, you're talking about all these spiritual powers that were populating the north and wanted to come into Israel and destroy Israel. Now also you have to remember, every time Israel got invaded, except from Egypt, it was from the north. And these guys passed through here. And and it happened consistently. So again, every time they got invaded, it was from the north. The part of Israel that split off from the basic southern portion went north and became idol worshippers. We've talked about that. When the people first took the land, they defeated Og in the north. And in Genesis 6, this is why I had you read it, we see a story of a group of fallen angels who arrive on earth and polluted with sin and their offspring, which are called giants or Nephilim. In the book of Enoch, which is a pseudepigraphal book, gives us some additional information as to where this place was. It actually says, here's where they came down. Enoch chapter 6. 
And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied, sounds an awful lot like Genesis, doesn't it? That in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Simjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. By the way, when they did some digging on top of Mount Zaphon, they actually found a carving that they then sent to England, and that's what it said on it, which was kind of interesting. They swear to all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations above it, upon it. And then they were uh, in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. So an Israelite would be aware of this. They know the book of Enoch. Uh, in fact, it's considered a canonical book for the Ethiopic Christians. They, they, it's part of their Bible. So they would say, yeah, that's, that's where they came down. They came down at Mount Hermon. So again, looking at a map of the area, what we're seeing is that, again, Mount Hermon to the north. So recall that for Ezekiel, many times up to this point, he's pointed out in the real world a physical enemy. And then again, he follows up by saying, oh, by the way, there's a real power behind the throne on this. In Ezekiel 38, he starts off by bringing up a person, Gog. And we don't know whether he's a real person or not. But we do know he comes from the far north. Hmm. From a Judean perspective, that means he's from demon central. Is this a real person? Or is this a reference to a spiritual authority, a fallen angel, a power that's in alignment with Satan that's going to encourage all these nations to attack and destroy Israel? If you think like, a, like someone from that nation... You could, say, you could very easily say, well, it's a person who's empowered by that guy, or it's that guy. They, they'd be okay saying either one. We also saw early that a tribe from Israel made the far north of Mount Hermon and Bashan their home. Dan, right? Now here's, here's some interesting information about the tribe of Dan. In Revelation chapter 7, we have 144,000 men who are listed by tribe that will be preachers preaching the gospel during the tribulation. One tribe is not mentioned, the tribe of Dan. They're not referenced there. Now, let me give you some background about the tribe of Dan. It was a checkered history. They forsook their allotted inheritance. Remember, we talked about that when we studied the book of Judges. They had a guy who actually was their judge, and it didn't work out well for him. His name was Samson. And after the whole thing with Samson, they left and they went north. And we actually studied a little bit about that in the book of Judges, where you see the, 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 they take a Levite with them, they go up north, they become idol worshipers up there. We see the first reference to it in Joshua 19, but in Judges 18 is where we see all this beginning to happen. And they eventually conquer the city of Laish, and they rename it Dan. And it became a cult center to Baal later in Israeli history. So instead of receiving, and if you go back to in, in the book of Genesis, in, when Jacob was giving blessings, his blessing to Dan was, Dan shall be like a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heel so that his rider falls backwards. Hi, son, you're a snake. That's what he basically said. And you see this cryptic note in Deuteronomy 33, 22, where Moses also blesses the tribes. And he says, Dan is a lion's club that leaps from Bashan. They weren't going to be in Bashan. They were going to be in the south. But he predicted they were going to go north. So as prophesied with respect to Judah, so did he also with respect to his son, Dan. So Judah was his fourth son. Dan was his seventh son. And he says, let Dan be a serpent sitting by the way that bites the horse's heel. Well, when I say the word serpent, what do you start thinking about? Satan, right. Okay, and a horse's heel? 
Well, who deceived Eve and who bruised Adam in the heel? Seeing now that we must make proof of what is alleged at greater length, we will not shrink from the task. This is, this is actually written by Hippolytus about 110 A.D. So I'm not reading anything that's really new. This has been around a while. For a certain, He is destined to spring from the tribe of Dan and to range himself in opposition like a princely tyrant, a terrible judge and accuser. As the prophet ter- testifies when he says, Dan shall judge his people as one tribe in Israel. But someone may say that this was meant of Samson, who sprang from the tribe of Dan and judged his people for 20 years, and that did happen. That, however, was only partially made good in the case of Samson. But this shall be fulfilled completely in the case of Antichrist. For Jeremiah, too, speaks in this manner. From Dan will she hear the sound of the sharpness of his horses at the sound of the neighing of the horses. The whole land trembled. And again, Moses says, Dan is a lion's whelp, and he shall leap from Bashan and that no one may fall into the mistake of thinking that this is spoken of the Savior, let him attend to this. Dan, he says, is a lion's whelp. And by thus naming the tribe of Dan as the one whence the accuser is destined to spring, he made the matter in hand quite clear. For Christ is born of the tribe of Judah, and this is Hippolytus' opinion, so Antichrist shall be born of the tribe of Dan. He's not the only one who thinks that. And as our Lord and Savior... Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was spoken of in prophecy as a lion on account of his royalty and glory. In the same manner also has the scripture prophetically described the accuser as a lion on account of his tyranny and his violence. That's interesting. So again, the north, Dan. Dan's not listed as one of the 144,000. Is it possible that the Antichrist might come up from Dan? Don't know. Hippolytus kind of thought he did. But what we see is that Gog would have been perceived as either a figure empowered by a supernatural evil. By the way, in the Bible, who's a power, who's someone that is empowered by supernatural evil? The Antichrist, right? I'm not saying that this guy's the Antichrist. We don't know, but I'm just pointing that out. Either a figure empowered by supernatural evil or an evil quasi-divine figure from the supernatural world bent on the destruction of God's people. So is it possible that this could be a manifestation of a fallen angel at the end of the age after Christians are out of the way? And the, remember, when we leave, so does the Holy Spirit. He, he's gone. The restrainer is removed. So you know, what kind of lies are going on on the world at that time? I don't know. But it's very in- interesting as you look at it. So again, the question, who is Gog? Well, a person, maybe. The Antichrist could be, could be that this is his first move to try and take over Israel and it doesn't end real well. I don't think so because the nation is at peace. If you go with him being the Antichrist, then you're saying, well, it's the end of the age. It's a battle that's taking place at the end of the tribulation, not at the middle or the beginning. Or is it a manifestation of a supernatural fallen evil one? Well, that could be the case too. So it could be someone who's possessed of, of of a demon. It could be or a fallen angel. We don't know. We, we really don't know. But we do know this. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 to 10, this is at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Okay? Notice what is referenced here. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Satan, who deceived the nations, and then he says, It's Gog and Magog. Are these the same fallen angels that did this before? Definitely not the same rulers. To gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. They came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they'll be tormented day and night. I have in my Bible right after that section of Scripture in Revelation, we when, because we do. We do see that Gog shows up one more time. So we see it show up at the end of the millennium. So what do we know? Gog personifies the enemy and darkness of the north where he's located. So is he, and they use the term eschatological, big word, this evil power this power behind the throne is going to empower some person who's going to be referred to as Gog. 
And that person will then lead a combined army against Israel. And it won't end well for them. So verses 1 to 3, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog. We've already been through this. The prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So, like I said, we're in verse 2 now, right? I warned you we weren't going to move real fast. Because there's, there's so much here, I want to make sure we don't miss it. Plus, as you start looking at it, you start realizing there's a lot more. The Lord's got a lot more going on sometimes than we really see because we have to take a look at what's going on behind the scenes. Because this is a supernatural book, and we don't pick up on that all the time. We want to make it some natural thing. And what God's saying is, wait a minute, here's the picture. Ezekiel's been showing it to you over and over again. Do you think this is going to be the same guy? The same one I've been talking about the last three times, Satan, Satan, Satan. Might be. Might be. Oh, Meshach and Tubal, yeah, we saw them before. We saw them back in Genesis chapter 10. This is the table of nations, by the way. If you ever want to reference where the 70 nations come from, they're referenced here in Genesis chapter 10. And this is, this is where you see this reference. The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Ripath and Togarma. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dadanim. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabteca. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba, and Dedan. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod, he became a mighty one of the earth. He was mighty hunter before the Lord because it said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. We're not going to get into that, but there's a lot going on there too in the Hebrew. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And from that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and rehoboth Ir and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Mizram became the father of Ludim and Anamim and Lehabim and Naphtulim and Pashkrum and Kashlum, which come from the which which came the Philistines, and Kaphtorim. That's those all wound up in the Greek Greece area, by the way, which really makes you wonder: the Philistines were Greeks? Could have been. Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn in Heth and the Jebusite and the Amorite and the Girgashite and the Hivite and the Archite and the Sinite and the Arvivite and the Zimorite, and the Hamathite, and afterwards the families of the Canaanite were spread abroad, and all the ites too. No, that's not there. The territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon, as you go from Gerar, as far as Gaza, as you go towards Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, literally, these are all the names of the, na of the nations. These are all people's names at some point. These were kids. Some of them turned out okay. Some of them, not so much. I'm not going to go into the rest of them. We'll cover a couple others later, but that's for you to take a look at. And we see Shem's family there too. You know, they're all listed. These are all the families of the sons of Noah, and, and all the nations of the earth come from these. That's where they come from. By the way, they are mapped. I'll put it in your notes next week because we're going to be wanting to see where these places are. So here's Gomer, and here's Magog. Notice I'm in Turkey, okay, right along the Black Sea. The, you know, here's the Caspian Sea. So we're talking, and Tagarma is right in this area. So this is where they're, we're talking about, right in this general area right here. The, the, the kings of the north or whatever, the far north, right there would be Zoth, the, uh, the mountain of Baal, and then Hermon is right over there. So that's why you start seeing some of the same things being referenced. And you've got all the rest of the nations listed there too. But Tubal and Meshach, they're Assyrians. Eastern Asia, Minor Asia, up, up towards that area. It originally extended far to the south, and they were in contact with the Hittites. But uh, eventually they went north, and they actually settled not far from the Black Sea. So when you start talking about Russia, yeah, maybe Russia's involved, but these are all people who live on the south side of the Black Sea, not the north side, or where half my family came from, Ukraine. And I didn't, that's, we're not talking about that area. We're talking about the south side. Gog's army, including Meshach, Tubal, Cush, Put, Gormar, Togarma, is constituted by the peoples, again, in Genesis 10. That's where I had you read it. 
So, and this is another thing too. Because it's in Genesis 10, you see this list and it says, here's how it all started. And then in Ezekiel, you get that same list. And here's how it's all going to end. There's the front end, there's the back end, all in one place. I'm reminded of Ecclesiastes 1.9, nothing new is under the sun. And what we see in the scripture is God will say where things start, and then he says where things end. What has been the goal of Satan all along since Genesis 3? To take over planet Earth and to rule everything. And by the way, to kill all of us in the, in the process. It hasn't changed. So as he, in Genesis 10, we see the table of nations. In Genesis 11, we see God divorcing the nations because they, once again, rebelled against him. And then he immediately tries, he immediately starts the plan of redemption with uh, Abraham. His goal is to restore earth to Eden. And we talked about that last week, didn't we? Where he turns Israel back into an Eden-like environment as, as a result of the last days. So God is determined to restore Eden on earth. Satan is determined to not allow that to happen. And remember, Satan hasn't changed. Remember what he was like back in Isaiah? In Isaiah chapter 14, we saw kind of his outline of what he is all about, and it really hasn't changed. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. There you go, number one. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. He's talking about those same mountain ranges that we've been talking about. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But he won't succeed. Remember, he's a defeated foe. He's already lost. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, we see this. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. There's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. We win. Now we're reading about and studying about a battle that hasn't taken place yet. It will. Again, the timing of it, I still think, is at the, after the rapture, but before the beginning of the tribulation. But we can't... It, have I made it clear that Russia's not mentioned? Okay. But it still may involve them. We don't know for sure. But it's definitely going to involve some Muslim nations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Maybe we'll get to verse 3 and 4 next week. Maybe 5. No rush. No rush. We'll get there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. We already know, based on the prophecies that Ezekiel has given in the past, that all came true, literally, that what he says now will take place in the future, literally just as he says. Our joy and our excitement is to start digging through it and seeing, well, what do you mean? What, is, what are all these words meaning? And then finding out that the stage is being set even now for these wars yet to take place. We're excited about living in the last days, Lord, and we're excited to be learning more and more about what your plan is for the nations and for planet Earth, but we also are excited over the fact that at some point in time you're going to come and call us home, and we're waiting for that, Lord, and we're ready to hear you say, come home. Thank you now, Lord, for this time in your word. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Ezekiel on the Unsafe Bible. Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this major prophet to help us all understand how to apply these messages to our lives today. Have you ever found yourself falling into the trap of sin, suffering the consequences, and then only after you realize it's too late, you offer up a prayer and ask God, why me? It's a classic case of you made your bed and now you have to sleep in it, but you still ask the question as if to suggest you may not be guilty. Well. As we see here in Ezekiel, that has been one of man's greatest weaknesses throughout history. If you want to hear more, don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. Once there, use the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. 
Just fill out the form and we'll reach out to you. To listen to this message or any others from Pastor Ken, just look under the media tab at theunsafebible.com. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you can show us your support for the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. No gift is too big or too small and will help us continue to reach the lost with God's Word. Any other questions? Feel free to explore theunsafebible.com for more information about when and where we meet. Directions can be found on the Contact tab. We're based out of Jupiter, Florida, and want to invite you to join us in person for our next service. Until then, we want to thank you for joining us right here on The Unsafe Bible.